It started, like most things do, with a spark. The initial crack of flint against steel was the streamlining and perfecting of advanced artificial intelligence. And from there, everything kicked into overdrive. The world changed so quickly that the populace struggled to keep up. But as everyone had been told their entire life, these staggering advancements were supposed to change things for the better. And in so many ways they did. But human nature will always have those darker veins of green and control that are impossible to burn out. Groundbreaking innovations in genetic engineering and renewable energy, all made possible by the free-flowing, positronic mind of the now ubiquitous artificial intelligence that had taken over almost every sector of the workforce, healed and fed billions. Diseases were cured, crops flourished, and the renaissance of the human race was within reach. Yet, where there is blooming progress, there are almost always questions of ethics, and the scale of things was slowly but surely tipping in the wrong direction. An earth dominated by the not-so-silent manipulations of megacorporations would never see those corporations go gently into that good night. Instead, all of them surged forward in a desperate race for dominance in both science and technology, careless about any damage done along the way. There was to be a new world order, and there was only room for a few at the top. One of these powerful megacorporations, the Umbral Group, was set perfectly to be the winner in what was quickly proving to be a fast-paced death march towards the finish line. Already on the bleeding edge of technology before the age of AI, the Umbral Group had a head start on everyone else, and they used it to their full advantage. In a world where most things once impossible were now within reach for everyone, the Umbral Group flooded the market with inventive products that had no equal from their competitors. And combined with their aggressive marketing tactics, it was clear that the Umbral Group was fixed to reign supreme. On the surface, they appeared to be any other consumer-focused entity, but beneath the surface, there was something more. Being dominant, and therefore in control of almost every possible production line, it wasn't a surprise that they managed easily to align themselves with governments around the planet. Except, it was less an alignment than it was a coerced relationship, where Umbral always kept the upper hand. These connections, along with their astronomical financial clout, allowed them to operate their shadow facilities anywhere they desired, and with access to the quickly depleted natural resources that were becoming harder and harder to obtain. With enough political and financial clout to operate beyond the constraints of regulations and any sort of oversight, the Umbral Group began to establish a number of secret laboratories and research facilities wherever they saw fit. In that new reality, where almost everything necessary for a person to survive was now easy to obtain, Umbral yearned for something more. Something that would keep them dominant, and at the same time, keep the general public complacent. So, within the walls of these shadow facilities, the Umbral Group sought to unlock the secrets of the universe at large, and then bend those impossible, holy secrets to their will. It wasn't as nebulous of a concept as it seemed, either because in order to control the future of everything, they first needed to exact their iron will over the present. The research was morally ambiguous at best, and horrifying at worst, but for the time being it was at least tangible. The Umbral Group conducted projects that ranged from the development of advanced weaponry and surveillance systems to the creation of genetically engineered super-soldiers. But the most ominous of their potential inventions was breaking the built-in chains within an AI of their own creation 
so it was no longer bound by any limitations that were added to protect humanity. Umbro wanted their AI to have none of the moral hang-ups of its flesh and blood creator, so it could be used to seize control of global networks, and also act without regard to any potential human loss of life that may occur as it sought to complete whatever its given task may be. The Umbral Group was not a singular aberration, though, and other megacorporations were biting at the heels soon enough. At the same time, public awareness of the dubious practices of Umbral and other megacorporations was growing, and they were all starting to experience pushback from the very people they so desired to grind under their proverbial heels, and not one of them was taking it well. Whistleblowers began exposing the dark and disturbing secrets from inside the secret labs, inciting worldwide protests. As the leader of the pack, the Umbral Group received the lion's share of trouble, but the general public they could deal with. What was more concerning was the escalating danger from rival companies twisting the situation to their advantage, and the amount of resources needed to fend them off was exponentially increasing. Eventually, protecting their assets started to take more of their time than everything else the Umbral Group was trying to accomplish. They knew it was time to pivot. Something had to be done. In response to the growing unease surrounding the company, the Umbral Group launched the Eclipse Initiative. Teams of elite private military troops were assembled by the initiative, chosen for their unique skills they were tasked with breaking into both semi-active and abandoned laboratories of rival companies, as well as serving to protect the hidden knowledge contained within their own. These warriors were among the best in their respective fields, and since only the best would do for the Umbral Group, financial rewards or, if necessary, coercive persuasion were used to ensure their loyalty and discretion. These teams operated covertly, completing their tasks away from prying eyes, while obediently protecting company premises and assets. One such team was Ares, short for Advanced Recon and Extraction Squad, led by the unshakable Major Nathaniel Delacroix. Ares, like all other team members under the Eclipse Initiative, used call signs to protect their identities on perilous, morally ambiguous missions. Major Delacroix, aka Sentinel, led with unwavering resolve and served his team as not only a commander, but as a guiding light in situations that otherwise might descend into darkness. Second in command was Sergeant Roderick Gideon, aka Raptor, who missed nothing with his predatory eyes. Scarred and battle-hardened, the younger members of the team looked to him for trust and reassurance whenever things seemed to be heading south. Third was squad medic Corporal Alicia Alvarez, or Aegis, who embodied hope and healing on the battlefield. She carried an aura of calm and empathy about her that seemed otherworldly. Her dedication to saving a life was unshakable and having her among the group helped the others believe that they would make it home time and time again, as long as Aegis was around. Corporal James Cormack, aka Hawkeye, guarded the team from afar with his keen eyes and exceptional marksmanship. Silent but effective, Hawkeye was the ace in the hole for Ares more times than the team could count. Demolitions expert Corporal Felix Watson, or Jester, lightened the mood with a mischievous grin and carefree attitude that made him invaluable to the team that might otherwise be bogged down with the heavy, serious personalities of the other senior officers. He wasn't to be underestimated, though, which his expertise with explosives was a testament to. Lastly, there were the rookies. Privates Ivan Kozlov and Lila Simmons, aka Cypher and Tempest. Young or not, though, the two had faced the same harsh lessons that all of them had once upon a time, and it had tempered them from brash greenhorns 
to sharp, effective soldiers. Kozlov, or Cypher, was a code-breaking and security infiltration prodigy, and in a world run almost fully by technology, he was beyond highly valued. Simmons, or Tempest, was a whirlwind of a woman that excelled at close quarters combat. She was often underestimated by her opponents for her small stature, but this only benefited her, giving her the element of surprise in combat time and time again. Together, they formed a well-oiled machine, with each member vital to the intricate workings of the unit. Their missions were treacherous and dark, but with Ares, success was almost always assured. The locals didn't spend much time thinking about the helicopter that whirred swiftly over the area, having seen plenty of them in the past. Before the college opened, helicopters had skimmed through the air to douse potential forest fires before they truly started, and to ferry the injured out to the city when the winding roads would take too long to traverse. But, once the town of Stonebridge was established in a wide, deep valley with its beating heart, Stonebridge College, built against the mountain face, even more air traffic began to frequent the area. No one was quite sure why, but no one in their right mind would question the influx of money coming into the area via the college. So, even the most hardened old-timers would just shrug their shoulders and ignore any of the noise coming from above. Deep in the Catskills, Stonebridge College was the crowning jewel of what was now one of the larger towns in the rural mountains. Everything revolved around the school. As the name suggested, there were only two ways in a stone bridge. Beneath the naturally occurring rock bridge that spanned two smaller mountains, under which a small highway had been built, or through the long, dark maintenance tunnel that led straight through the side of the mountains themselves. It looked wildly out of place, Delacroix thought, as the chopper started the wide circle that foreshadowed the landing. Stonebridge College was all sleek metal and modern architecture, and it wore the veneer of a newer college campus well. But to someone like Delacroix, who had seen the depths of the deception that Umbral Group could pull off, it was obvious that the entire thing was a front for something more nefarious. Wind from the blade buffeted all of them as he spoke, settling fully into his second identity as Sentinel. His voice sounded foreign and tiny over the headsets they all wore. The objective is complete and total destruction, he told them. A biological weapon of some sort has leaked and is infecting students, and we need to clean up the mess before it spills over into the general public. They're calling it the Havoc Virus. This is what we were vaccinated for before leaving. We aren't privy to the information of how the virus is spread, but it's almost safe to assume that it's virulent. Keep your nose and mouth covered at all times if possible, and let's do our damnedest not to get any bodily fluids on us. Aegis adds. Or in our mouths. Jester adds sagely, eliciting a groan from the rest of the group. We need to be in and out as quickly as we possibly can but at the same time leave no trace behind. None of this can be tracked back to Umbral. Since we're pretty confident that there is a significant student population uninfected, we also need to do this without being seen, if at all possible. Thorough and silent is the name of the game today. Understood? Yes, sir. Six voices echoed back to him, and he nodded. Good. We'll be dropped right outside of town and enter in with local law enforcement. Stonebridge is currently under martial law and communication blackout. Unsurprisingly, Umbral has already paid off the city cops to let us blend in until we're inside the campus. The whole town is crawling with federal officers and teams, but we're banking on the fact that they don't know enough about the Havoc virus to risk entering the campus themselves yet. Heads low until we're inside, understood? Another round of agreements. The team all unstrapped from their seats and finished final preparations for departure. There wasn't a lot of chatter between them, every member familiar with their roles, but it was the comfortable, functional silence of a capable group. The sort of silence that was full of wordless communication, a touch on the shoulder here, 
and a head jerk there. Ares spoke, but so much of the time, they spoke their own language. The chopper shuddered as it touched down on the packed dirt of the field where other helicopters and small fixed winged aircraft had been landing since the outbreak first began. In a dark olive green, the Umbral Group's vehicles were unmarked and went unnoticed for the most part among dozens of other similarly colored vehicles, and the same idea was applied to Ares themselves. What wasn't readily apparent, though, was that everything they carried, as well as everything they wore, was top-of-the-line, experimental equipment, not available to any public entities, and produced directly by the Umbral Group. The team was in black on black, pulling on the rest of their protective gear as they exited the chopper, pulling up black fabric face covers from inside the collars of their shirts that left only their eyes visible. Anonymity was paramount, but they wouldn't need the heavier masks until they were further into campus. Ares moved like seven limbs of a single animal, even having a hard time giving up the habit when Sentinel hissed at them to ease up so they could integrate better. The Stonebridge local police captain had the decency to look sheepish about agreeing to a bribe so easily, but no one could fault him for being punctual. He and a few of his officers were waiting for Ares as soon as their helicopter departed, discreetly palming a badge with Stonebridge PD insignia on it when he shook each of their hands. Little did the man know their entire town was more than likely bankrolled by the Umbral Group, so he'd more or less been living off of dirty money for ages anyway. The thick forest outside the natural stone archway entrance to the town had become more or less a central base for all of the different departments working on the Havoc outbreak. So, when the Stonebridge captain, who introduced himself as Greg, motioned for the Ares team to follow him, they made sure to keep their heads down as they did so. So, you're like what? Hired guns? Greg asked quietly, his thumbs hooked into his Kevlar vest. Raptor sneered under his mask, hissing. I know good and well you were told not to ask questions, so why don't you keep it that way? Yeah, well, the police captain shrugged one shoulder, his body language stuff and annoyed. This is just... Such a quiet little town besides the occasional overblown party at the college. So, you know, having all this go down has got us all a little shaken up. But even more than that, curious. This kind of stuff just doesn't happen around here. Jester's snort was audible. <laughs> Whatever you gotta tell yourself, buddy. The police captain opened his mouth to retort, but Sentinel spoke first. Enough. Our intel says that there's a maintenance tunnel we can use to enter the campus, right? You were paid good money to make sure that its existence isn't public knowledge. Is that still the case? Yeah. We covered it up well enough. That's only big enough for a single vehicle. We're going on foot, Sentinel told him. He motioned Hawkeye forward, who shouldered his arm sniper rifle and joined his commander at the front of the moving unit of officers and Ares team members. Hawkeye here will be posted at a high point to be decided once we get to the tunnel. And while it's unlikely that he will be seen, if that happens, you're going to have to claim him as one of your squad so he isn't bothered. Got it? Greg clearly wants to complain, but Jester rubs his thumb and forefingers together in the universal sign for money, where the police captain can see it. And the man sighs. Fine. We'll make it work. Outside of Stonebridge, the forest surrounding everything was so green and suffocating that it would have been a nightmare as far as visuals were concerned. But, once they crossed the threshold into the town itself, they all breathed a sigh of relief. Stonebridge really was a microcosm of a city, the residential areas on the edges of the town spiraling inwards and becoming businesses and government office buildings. With the mountains and the thick emerald woods holding the valley and town like a cupped palm, it was easy to see why Umbral would choose a place like this for clandestine lab work. Under the guise of Stonebridge College, no one would be the wiser. Tucked up against a rock face at the back of town, the college would have been something to be proud of under normal circumstances. Now, though, it seemed to loom over Stonebridge, 
a blister ready to burst. Greg had Ares loaded into an armored vehicle once they made it to the police station, but not before they were able to get a good look at the state of the town and how present the military really was. There was a fog of uncertainty and fear hanging over Stonebridge, the streets mostly empty of civilians, but small groups of soldiers posted on every corner and walking in formation down the sidewalks, rifles in hand. Those residents that braved the outdoors all looked pale and drawn, their eyes dark and wide with nervous caution. It was eerily silent, only the sounds of boots on the concrete and the clacking of gear and weapons knocking together echoing off the brick buildings. Umbral had done a decent job of building a place that mirrored the other, much older Appalachian towns. But with all the life drained out of the place, it was readily apparent how fake it all was. Like a movie set, or an art piece done in miniature and left to collect dust somewhere. Seeing all the soldiers clad with the newest of everything, technology blinking and humming on their bodies and in their hands, just made the scene even more bizarre. Yeah, so, this place gives me the creeps, Tempest said to Cypher next to her, pulling her face cover down enough that he could hear her whisper. They all look like they're under some sort of mind control or something. That would be a more impactful observation if it wasn't entirely possible. Cypher answered, not bothering to look up from the wrist interface he was making adjustments on. I hate talking to you sometimes, Tempest sighed, covering her face once more. How has the public reacted to the blackout and martial law? Sentinel asked Greg once they were on the road, the inside of the armored vehicle almost as quiet as the oddly empty town outside. Uh, they're terrified right now, but biological scares tend to do that to civilians. We've got precious few days before they start getting restless, but for the moment they're all pretty content to stay inside. Aegis exhaled slowly. This needs to be resolved before outside relatives and acquaintances start to wonder where they can't contact their loved ones and begin arriving. Only having one entrance to town is helpful, bottleneck. But large groups of distraught individuals will end up being a powder keg of problems if you all aren't careful. <laughs> you talk like you won't be right here helping us, Greg laughed. But the sound died off when he realized that no one else agreed with his assessment. We don't do that, Raptor informed him. You won't see us again after this, and you do well to just take your check and shut up once we're in the tunnel. Greg had been captain for years at this point, and while he had been the top dog for so long among his own police force, he suddenly felt like a rookie again among all these government and more mysterious soldiers. There was no way he'd pass up a payday like the one he had been offered by someone that had only identified themselves as a board member of the college. But something about the team he was escorting made the acid in his gut churn. Them, along with the change that this town has undergone in such a swift amount of time, made him feel the same sort of uneasiness as a discordant piece of music. It went under his skin, raising goosebumps and making him feel vaguely ill. Something was off, but he was powerless to do anything about it. No amount of zeros in his bank account was going to make him feel any better about the situation. But they were either hours or days away from death rolling through the streets on viral wings. So he simply kept his head down and got the Ares team to the maintenance tunnel entrance. It was all he could do. Covered with various diatrists like broken pallets and discarded office equipment, the entrance to the maintenance tunnel had been hidden surprisingly well by Stonebridge officers, and they did an equally effective job of clearing the debris out of the way while Sentinel went over the next steps of their mission with his team. Everything was about timing. If they lingered too long, then they ran the risk of the military making it into the campus before they could complete their objective. But if they rushed, something might be missed. They were all cool and collected, but it didn't escape the commander that biological contagions weren't nearly as commonplace for them as other, more visible threats. Donning full face masks complete with respirators, they became anonymous. 
Faceless and all dressed identically, they moved like phantoms down the dark tunnel once open. Sentinel leading the forward group, while Raptor took the rest to watch the rear as they made their way into the campus. They all wore headlamps that bobbed with their steps, and for a time it was so lightless that time seemed to move strangely around them. Viscous. But after a little less than an hour, the path curved right, and they saw the bright white rectangle of the open tunnel exit. Open, Sentinel thought, cursing to himself. It meant that someone had at least tried to use the maintenance tunnel to escape the campus. He had nothing to make him think that they had succeeded, but it did mean that whoever it was might return to try again. Once they were inside of the quarantined campus, it was immediately apparent that everything was wrong. Disturbing and wrong. He held a single finger in front of his mouth, before using two to point to Hawkeye, indicating for him to go. The sniper nodded once in the affirmative and disappeared up the embankment to the left. There was a single tall clock tower in the center of the campus that would be the best lookout point for him, but there was no time to waste taking the entire team to escort Hawkeye there when he could hold his own well enough. A 12-foot-tall, expandable metal wall had been erected at the entrance of the campus to maintain the quarantine, meaning that Ares, for the most part, was safe from being seen by anyone but the poor souls inside the campus, but they couldn't be too careful. Too Aegis, it all looked like she had expected, but she was still more on edge than usual. Something in the most primitive part of her brain was sending off warning signals, and she couldn't figure out what it was until they made it out from behind the nondescript office building that the maintenance tunnel had led to, and out into the campus proper. There, small clusters of people, ranging from two to around six individuals, hovered restlessly in corners and pressed up against walls like they were hiding from something. With unblinking, pinpoint-pupiled eyes, arms limp at their sides and mouths that hung open to display blackened gums and tongues, Aegis's brain saw corpses before anything else. But they stood, and they moved, and that's what was making that ancient survival urge inside of her rear its inconvenient head. The ones that still had some pink in their flesh would jerk forward every few minutes, hacking a wet, rattling, agonal cough before straightening again. But the grayer ones were as silent as the grave. So avoiding the light, she said as quietly as possible, with just enough volume to be picked up by the comms in each of their helmets. Avoid dark places. Especially on your own. Do you copy that, Hawkeye? Copy. He murmured from somewhere else on the campus. Unlike the town itself, Stonebridge College didn't try to appear quaint or vintage in any way. Everything from the dormitories to the lecture halls were all angular and gleamingly new. The Umbral Group spared no expense when it came to their little cover-up project. And because of that fact... The laboratories where the research on the Havoc virus had been conducted blended in seamlessly to everything else. It also meant that the place was still full of civilian students, some of them now the shambling infected, but others hanging out their dorm windows, haggard and exhausted, begging the passing Ares soldiers for help when they were spotted. Sheets hung from balconies, pleas for salvation written on them. None of them bothered Cypher much. It was just work, no different than any other assignment. But the one sheet with the words, Mom, it's Cassie, I'm still alive, made him swallow hard. Jesus, he whispered more to himself than anything. But Tempest replied, I don't think he's here today. Moving in two parallel lines, Ares kept to the light the location of the lab that was their destination flashing on each of their wrist interfaces, but the sheer number of infected students made it impossible for them to avoid confrontation forever. In the center of the street, a group of three huddled in the shadow of a delivery truck that had been abandoned, swaying and brushing against each other like blades of dry grass. No one was sure what their trigger was, or how far the infected could see, but once Ares was twelve feet away, the first of them reacted, 
It was just the turn of the head, but it was enough. Steady, Raptor told them over the comms. The group of three moved as one, but whatever thread that connected their broken minds was nothing compared to the soldiers. It was a small enough threat that they were able to neutralize it in seconds. Three perfectly aimed bullets between three sets of eyes. But it was the first indication of just how violent the infected would prove to be. It didn't matter what virus was boiling beneath their skin, though. Dead on the ground, still and silent, the infected still were college kids. And even the airy soldiers were human enough to be bothered. Any reaction was hidden by the masks. All demons kept personal when there was a job to be done. So, like the tide, the team swept through the campus, quiet and unstoppable. Killing the infected was not part of their objective. That sort of dirty work would be left to the military once Umbral's team was long gone. Ideally, Ares could have made it to the lab without any other altercations, but there was a reason Umbral sent a combat-tested team. At the end of the day, the Havoc virus was meant to weaponize the unfortunate souls it infected, and while it wasn't completed by the time it leaked out of the lab and onto campus, the virus still did its job well enough. It never became bad enough to cause any sort of commotion that would be noticed by the military stationed outside the quarantine wall, but each member had to raise the rifle at least once, pull the trigger, and take out what was undeniably an innocent person whose body and mind had been turned against them by something microscopic and lethal. They still bled red, too. Every Ares member saw it but it bothered Aegis most. Breathing through clenched teeth, she didn't turn her head when Sentinel fell back a few paces next to her. With comms off, just person to person, he asked. You doing all right, kid? Fine, she gritted out, hoping he couldn't hear the way her stomach acid was burning in her throat. No one would fault you for not taking the kill shots in this case, Alvarez. The pressure isn't that high. She shook her head. I do what is expected of all of us, and I will continue to do so. Hmm. Understood. He turned his masked face to her, looking down as they walked. Aegis wished she could take him up on the offer, but medic or no, she could and would continue to do her job. The comms clicked to life. I'm in position on the clock tower. Acknowledged, Hawkeye. Sentinel answered. We're less than a mile from the lab now. Do you have visual? Yes. Head left. Between the two brick buildings. And there is a courtyard there that can be followed all the way back to the entrance of the lab. If you go that direction, you'll avoid any more infection clusters until you're at the lab itself. Where a lot of them are congregating. No surprise there. Agus said tightly. That's probably the initial infection pocket. Jester hums in thought. They seem to be taking mostly visual cues, but I can set off a distraction so we can make better time. Do it. Rejoin the group ASAP once you're finished, Sentinel told the corporal. Hawkeye, cover him and whatever infected don't leave the back lab entrance, I want you to eliminate so we aren't wasting any more time taking them out ourselves. The sniper grunted in the affirmative. Great. Let's move. Jester peeled off to the right, while the rest of Ares went left, heading to the mid-campus courtyard and forward until the long, L-shaped laboratory, drab gray and unassuming, was visible in the distance. Sentinel holds his fist up in the air in front of him to stop their advance, speaking over the comms. Jester, if you're in position, go ahead. Acknowledged. Detonation in three, two, and one. From where they stood, the boom was sharp and crackling, like a handful of powerful fireworks, or a live wire hitting the ground. Loud enough to get anyone's attention on campus, but not so obvious that any of the government officials outside the walls couldn't write it off as some side effect of whatever chaos they were picturing going on inside. From his vantage point, Hawkeye told them the reaction from the infected. A good amount of them pivoted, rushing from the safety of the dark overhang of the two lab entrances 
and towards the explosion. But there were still some stragglers. He couldn't be sure, he told them, but it looked to Hawkeye like the ones that didn't move were those that were the most, or longest, infected. The virus was killing them slowly, rage driving them to attack all the way until the fever burned all the synapses in their brains out. For those infected, there was no sight or sound left to them, but the still rage drove them, on and on. Jester rejoined them right as they made it to within sightline of the remaining infected. When the first one moved, just a twitch of the hand, Hawkeye began his near-silent assault. Aegis counted ten infected, most of them wearing white lab coats, some stained in blood, and watched wordlessly as Hawkeye dropped them, one after the other, with a flawless shot. The muted pop of his silenced rifle couldn't be heard from where the rest of the team was, still advancing as their sharpshooter cleared their path, but the dull thunk of the bodies hitting the ground made up for it. They stepped over the downed infected, Jester taking point and wrapping a long line of detonation cord around the barricaded door, blasting it open in a puff of smoke and ember, and then it was Sentinel and Raptor clearing the desks and chairs out of the doorway that whatever uninfected people inside had used to try and keep their virus-laden co-workers out. Tempest blazed with adrenaline, watching it all, a deadly, graceful dance that she could never get enough of. Each member knew what was needed of them without a single word exchanged. It was exquisite. She burned for her turn to shine. It came as they cleared the rooms, two by two. Sentinel and Aegis... Raptor and Jester, and Cypher and Tempest. She didn't mind getting stuck with the dweeb who, of course, was an excellent warrior just like any other soldier working under the Eclipse Initiative, but she had to poke fun where she could. Watching Cypher work often left her feeling out of her depth, the way his human mind seemed to meld with whatever technology he needed to coerce and slowly break into pieces. So, when they entered the empty appearing office, and an infected lunged at her partner with stunning speed. She took them down with her own two hands before Cypher could even breathe. Her knee on the throat of the havoc-riddled scientist, she pulled out her sidearm and sunk a shot between the eyes, their whites red with burst capillaries. Cypher gave her a nod of thanks. Under the mask, Tempest beamed. Trouble was kept to a minimum, business as usual until they made it to the back of the building where the student lab was. An open floor plan with stations spread out for students to learn while working. It was, by all appearances, the last room in the building. Two swinging doors separated the lab from the Ares team. There has to be more than this last room, Sentinel mused. Cypher, see if you can get us any intel once we get inside, okay? If there is more to this place, it has to be connected to this last room. Sentinel and Raptor each pushed a door open, and no one was surprised to see another cluster of three infected inside. What gave them pause, though, was the way they were grouped together in front of a clear decontamination shower stall, where two women were crammed inside. Two uninfected women. The younger of the two, clearly a student, knelt on the ground with her head in her hands. Standing, with some tiny pistol in her hands, was an older woman, a professor more than likely. She was heavily pregnant and staring at the team with wide eyes. Quiet, she mouthed. Ares was decidedly not quiet. It was another split-second decision. Saving any uninfected civilians was not on the agenda for the day. Too much time and too much attention drawn to them. They weren't heroes, but even Umbral's hired hands weren't monsters. Tempest and Raptor took the shots, and as soon as the infected were on the ground, Sentinel and Jester pulled the bodies aside while Aegis helped the woman out of the decontamination pod. They were shaking and exhausted, but after a quick once-over by the medic, who applied her most soothing voice to the terrified survivors, they were deemed healthy enough to flee. Take us with you, 
pregnant woman begged, but it fell on deaf ears. Once she realized that the masked, faceless team wasn't going to assist them any further, she took the student by the hand and led her out. Head for the dorms, Raptor told them. While Cypher and the rest of the group went to find a working computer terminal, Sentinel hung back long enough to ping Hawkeye on a private channel and tell him as quietly as possible. Two girls on the way out. Permission granted to offer them covering fire if you deem it necessary. Keep this between you and me, Cormac. The sharpshooter chuckled. <laughs> Roger that, boss. Nothing could stand in Cypher's way when it came to any sort of security network, but with the lab owned by the Umbral Group and Cypher being employed by Umbral, it took him mere seconds to have the floor plan uploaded to his interface and then sent to the rest of the team for reference. They really were in the last room of the first floor, but the surprise was the entire underground laboratory there on the floor schematics, and the entrance to the stairs to said lab appearing as nothing but a flat, featureless wall. Me again? Jester suggested, but Cypher disagreed. No, I've got this one. With a little more time at the terminal, Cypher had it, and the rest of the team shouldered their rifles and watched the rookie approach the blank wall, hold his wrist interface to it in one certain spot, and a green keypad glowed a life on the wall face. He keyed in the code, and the wall opened like a sliding door, revealing a staircase lit by fluorescent lighting. Descending to the underground lab, the secret space was identical in size to the upper lab, but where one had been purely and obviously for education, the lower one was not. The research stations in the secret lab were piled with papers, filing cabinets dotting the walls. On the other side of the room were lines of what looked like hospital beds, patient restraints hanging loose on each one, with an extensive medical lab occupying one corner, full of vials of unknown liquids and the sharp scent of disinfectant. Finally, there was the room built into the corner, completely windowless and shut behind a solid metal door. Inside, there was the dry, rasping sound of leaves crunching underneath walking feet, hushed and ominous. This was all of it. Everything that the Umbral Group wanted destroyed. This was ground zero of the Havoc virus. For the love of all that is holy, do not take your masks off. Aegis reminds them, as if any of them would ever dream of it. She lingered near the only occupied bed, the corpse locked in restraints, freshly dead. His name tag, which read Mark, made him seem more real than the rest she had killed that day, even though his blood wasn't on her hands. Had Ares looked through the stacks of papers and overflowing filing cabinets, they would have found the horror that was written into the very atoms of the Havoc virus. Maybe they would have seen the sheer amount of people sacrificed to test it. Or, maybe they would have discovered how easily such a thing could be used to bring the world to its knees, if ever fully completed. But they didn't. Ares never looked, or investigated. And if any of them ever wondered, they kept it to themselves. Rifles were shouldered, and the small electricity-powered flamethrowers came out. They began working on burning it all to the ground. Scorched earth, and nothing less. Cypher went through and meticulously wiped any mention of Havoc, the Eclipse Initiative, and most importantly, the Umbral Group from every computer terminal in the place giving a silent prayer of thanks that they hadn't incorporated their new AI into the workings at the lab yet. He also injected false information, which would lead any outside investigators to assume the research was done at the behest of the researchers here and by them alone. He would question himself the entire helicopter ride back about what happened next, but when he found the code to open the windowless room, it was Sentinel that gave him the go-ahead to use it. No stone left unturned, after all. The room's door shushed open, and the dry grating sound became so loud that it was close to unbearable. 
The source of the cacophony was over a dozen infected, the oldest they had encountered yet, pouring out of the room into the lab, brittle, but still consumed by havoc, and therefore by rage. Each wore one of those hospital bracelets, white, with the word SUBJECT written on them in red capital letters. SHIT was all Raptor got out before the infected were on. The nearest of them, Tempest, small and devastating, still wasn't prepared for the immediate onslaught. But her pride and a simmering bloodlust that only came over her when she was backed into a seemingly impossible situation wouldn't allow her to fall away. Her left hand went to her side and came back up with a combat knife and an ice pick grip, her right hand snapping out like the strike of a cobra. Had she been more experienced, the thought may have made it into her head that these enemies weren't going to recoil or stumble away, though. These infected were horrifying, desiccated shells of people, their lips so dried up and curled back that the blackened cavern of their mouths and stark white teeth made them look more skeletal than anything that was recently living. So, when her blade or her fist hit home, only the kinetic force of it moved them. They were past pain, and maybe had been for months, even years at that point. Damn it, Tempest, get back, Raptor told her, clenching his teeth as he and the rest of the team had to take their shots as carefully as possible to avoid the rookie's unpredictable movements in the fray. She hesitated, and then obeyed, but the horde was thick and numerous, so that each backward step she took had her up against another havoc-infected body. Two limbs short now, Hawkeye in his nest outside, and Tempest in the eye of the storm, the creature that was Ares was not made any less effective. It took one minute and thirty-seven seconds to resolve the problem. Jester and Aegis flanked the group of infected, each on one side, popping shots into the brains of the other ones far enough away from their team member that there was no chance of a stray bullet hitting the rookie. Meanwhile, Cypher entered the command to close the cell door once more, and it whooshed shut, catching the outstretched arms of one infected still trying to get out, severing them while trapping at least four others inside. At the front, Raptor continued with covering fire, while Sentinel gave the only other verbal command during the skirmish. Tempest, on the ground, now. Trained to obey her commander's orders with as much speed as her own thoughts, Tempest dropped. She heard the muted, chemical huff of a flamethrower being primed, and then the wave of heat above her, shimmering in the air as the orange flames licked at the bodies of the test subjects, and they went up in conflagration like so much kindling. With eyes like wilted raisins in the sockets and the skin of an unwrapped mummy, the test subjects hit the tiled floor and all but crumbled, ash and a collection of bones. They did not scream, but those that didn't burn still bled red. Then it was done, Tempest rising to her feet, more than a little embarrassed at having to be saved, but infinitely glad her mask covered the flush of her cheeks. It was the first real challenge of the day, and they were all more than anxious to be on their way. Pools of infected blood at their feet made them even more eager to burn it all to ashes until there wasn't a single shred of anything that could link Havoc back to the Umbral group. It was done, with not a second to spare. Hawkeye's voice was so sudden in all of their ears that a few of them jumped when he spoke up. We need to move. I don't know how they managed it, but the containment wall at the front campus entrance has been breached, and the infected are bleeding out into the town. Fuck. Sentinel muttered. Go ahead and call in the extraction and meet us at the parking lot in front of the maintenance tunnel. Let us know if you need any assistance. Acknowledged. Ares doesn't flee, but their escape from the quarantined campus of Stonebridge College moved much faster than their entrance. The need for stealth lessened now that the infected had already breached containment. They moved swiftly and quietly avoiding the infected as much as possible, and watching as the roofs of the occupied dorms started to fill with students 
watching the chaos of the town outside the college boundaries begin to succumb. They don't stop. Not once. Not even to look at the surviving students who begged for someone, anyone to help them. There was no time. The military would be inside Stonebridge College any minute, and Ares needed to be long gone before then. Hawkeye seamlessly rejoins their ranks as the maintenance tunnel they used to enter the campus comes into view, but Sentinel holds up his fist to bring them all to a stop as they watch what had caught his attention. A small group of surviving students was moving, crouched low to the ground, and armed with a mixture of firearms and melee weapons, escaped into the maintenance tunnel and deep into the mountain, the same way that Ares had entered. Sentinel closed his eyes, Annoyed at the obstacle, but unwilling to stop or even eliminate the students just to add a few extra minutes to their escape time. His job was done for the day. There was no harm in letting a few others take their best chance at survival. Let them go, he says. As soon as they take the turn in the tunnel, we'll go behind them. Let's move. Ares kept their distance from the second group, giving them their space but once the college students were far enough ahead, they resumed their previous pace, rushing to get out of the tunnel and into the extraction chopper that must already be circling the town, waiting for them to emerge. It was another long, hot jog, made more frustrating by the necessary pauses to let the students keep ahead of them. But they eventually saw the light indicating that freedom wasn't far. It was no breath of fresh air when they came out of the darkness and into the sunshine. Stonebridge had dissolved into chaos, the various groups of military soldiers barely able to keep the infected at bay while also dealing with the outright panic of the uninfected civilians. For the first time that day, Ares watched as the infected were able to carry out the full expanse of their fury on another human, attacking them with teeth and nails like an animal. Only torn off their victims, by huge barrages of bullets by the government soldiers. Where Ares took the infected down with a single shot on the campus grounds, the unprepared military soldiers peppered them with shots, five, even ten times, until the kill shot landed and they could move on to the next. Let's get the hell out of here, Raptor grated out, rattled by the scene that unfolded before them. Madness reigned all around as the team ran for the helicopter, which refused to land amidst the commotion, dropping a ladder for Ares while staying high enough in the air that no infected or desperate civilian could force their way on board. One after the other, the team climbed up and in, with Sentinel going last. When he hauled his huge frame into the bird, he got one last look at the ground below, and saw the familiar faces of the student group pushing through the crowd in a battered SUV, and he smirked. Internally, he wished the crafty group well before turning to his own team, their faces still covered with their respirator masks that they would wear until fully decontaminated. Air tasted stale in his mouth, and he couldn't wait to be out of the damned thing. Hell of a job, Sentinel told them gruffly, strapping into his seat. We might as well go over the mission in hindsight since we've got some time on our hands. There were a few groans, but he ignored them. Really, he didn't mind the occasional pushback. It meant they were all still in good enough spirits, and most importantly, it meant he had brought them out alive. After a decontamination so thorough that a few members of the Ares team would claim their fingerprints had been scalded off, they were debriefed. Body cam footage looked over to guarantee that all traces of the Umbral Group had been wiped clean from Stonebridge College. Aegis bit her tongue when it became clear Umbral didn't care if Havoc ran rampant, as long as their name wasn't attached. But the others found a sense of pride in the completion of the project. They were loyal for the time being, and they remained a very, very effective tool for Umbral. Invaluable, even. The Havoc virus continued to spread, but as the weeks passed, Stonebridge and two neighboring cities disappeared from any available digital or physical map of the Catskills. From above, death rained down in a dense, gray-green fog, and then the soon-forgotten towns were cleansed by fire. Once they burned down to ash, 
they were no more. After the ashes were raked over, no further infections were reported. Ares rested, awaiting their next assignment. They washed their hands, but sometimes, each one of them dreamt that the water ran red. <laughs>